Hello folks, welcome to another week. How are you doing? Hope you're all doing very well. I've had a good weekend. Just about recovering from the weekend's drinking, so ugh, nearly there. If you like what I do, please um, head on to Patreon or onto the channel member side of the YouTube algorithm down below and become a member or become a Patreon. Uh, every little bit helps. We're about halfway towards the £750 target. I'm um, climbing steadily, but uh, yeah, as soon as we get there, I can stop relying on ad revenue because, you know, it's better for the mental health if you don't even look at it. It's a load of rubbish. Um, beside that, please, if you like what I do and you need some models, head over to Composite Games. They can get you 20% uh, off at checkout, usually, on Games Workshop stock. And with the promo code Northern Exile down below, you get another 5% off of your checkout purchase. So 25% off, which is half of the GW staff discount. And lastly, if you do become a Patreon, a, a member of the Patreon at any, at any amount, or you become a member of the channel, you are instantly entered into the prize draw. Um, this week, I'm not sure what the prize draw is going to be. It's going to be a certain amount of models from Composite Games for free. I'm about to put in my order for this month to the winners of last month's uh, uh, in July. The winner, winners of that prize draw will be getting... Uh, they're 30 pounds worth of free models sent straight to them. I don't care where you are on the world I will get the models to you Because you know you've become a patreon you put your faith in me I repay that faith and make sure that you get the models that you that you win when you get through the prize draw it will be on The 26th I think I said last time um, So we're looking at the 20 so I'll draw it on the 26th. Yeah, so Friday the 26th It's when we will be drawing our next one. So you've got a few weeks to get involved with patreon or become a channel member, and that will get you an instant uh, instant entrance into the prize draw. I need to look up what we've got in the in the old kitty to make sure that we know what we're doing. But I'm thinking it will be around £50 each. So, two winners, £50 of free models. That's what I'm thinking at the moment. So, you want those three models? Enter in the competition and uh, come and have some fun with us. So... Let's look at some hobby nightmares, shall we? It is Monday, after all, and we need to get you through the working week. And we do have, I will say this, we do have um, a sequel to Natna's story, because a lot of you were asking for that one about Tom. So we do have a sequel to that one, and a few stories on that guy coming up. Um, yeah, he, he really did blue ball us last time, didn't he? He got us all the way there, and then just like went, yeah, you know what? It's all good. Let, let's come back another time, and we'll finish off then. So anyway... Our first story is by High Fleet Kalish, and he says, Good day, North. I feel like sharing a funny story with you. Oh, by the way, um, the vocabulary in these stories has been really good. I, I do pre-read them. Um, well, I pre-read most of them. Some of them slip through the cracks, and they're just on the list, and uh, I read them. There was There are one or two, and I, I have said this before. If I have to rewrite your submission, because it's that bad, I'm not reading it out. So... I may message you back and say you need to tidy this up or I'm not reading it because I, I can't make heads or tail of it. Um, please don't be offended if I say that. It just means that I literally can't understand it. That's the only reason I'll come back to you and say that. I won't, I won't, I won't say it nickpicking. I'll just say, look, you know, I, I literally can't understand this and I'm not going to rewrite it. That's not my job. You know, you rewrite it, send it back to me and I'll read it out. So, yeah, I've had to do that a few times this time around. Uh, but the ones I picked out have been really well written. So thank you very much for those of you who put the effort in and uh, really gave me some nicely written stories. So, first of all, good day, North. Feel like sharing a funny story with you, says High Fleet Kalish. This story happened a few years ago, back when I was running as a, G a GM for a campaign for an RPG that I co-wrote with some friends. Excellent. Best way to do it. The gaming sessions were basically playtests which turned out to be a horrible idea. As after session two, it set the tone that arguing semantics of rules was perfectly acceptable. Yeah, um, I find it the other way. Like when I've asked friends to playtest something, like the Black Coats campaign we did was me, was us playtesting some rules that I'd written. Um, we tended to go on the proviso that, imagine playing D&D with Gary Gygax and then arguing with Gary Gygax on uh, how the rules should be interpreted. You don't, do you? You wouldn't. He wrote the fucking things. Same with me, right? That like you're in the room, you're in the session with the guy who wrote the rules. If I say it, it's interpreted one way, that's it. it. Doesn't matter how I've written it, 
It's about how I, you know, you're asking the writer what he meant by a certain line, and I can, you know, I can give him a, a, a black or white answer. Do you know what I mean? So, I figured out it takes a, it takes quite a lot of the guesswork away rather than adds to it. But you know. Anyway, Khalees says it had something to do with myself being the creator of the story universe. I guess all the players at some time or another felt entitled to bend it to what they wanted to suit their character. Right, so that because because it's your thing, they thought they could come in and, and right. Okay. Having listened to your show a lot lately, I realise the massive error it is to to allow that as a GM or DM. Yeah. Recently, I just I have played RPGs with gamers whose outlook is the GM as God. It was a breath of fresh air. Yeah, you can't play the game any other way. Um, if you're looking for, I mean, you can obviously. Me saying you can't is a bit facetious, but. If you want a decently balanced game where everyone's going to have a good time, I think the only real way to do it is to say the GM is God. It doesn't matter what happens, you know, what they say goes, you know. It doesn't matter whose story or setting it is, it is what it is. So, I've actually had friends uh, run campaigns in my settings before with my rules that I've played in. Um, and I've always said, I've, I don't have any input here, Right? And if a law thing comes up and people want a bit of clarification, the DM will sometimes ask me, and I'll say, oh, yeah, it's this way. You know, it's said this way, or the kingdom does this, or, you know, that sort of a thing, you know? But in terms of the rules and the story that they're trying to tell, no input whatsoever. I don't have one, you know? And I will never... If they do something that contradicts the rules, I don't care. It contradicts the law that I've written a little bit, I don't care. GM is God, and it's what it is. Now, if they say there's all of a sudden fairies and things in there... I'd be like, no, that, that's clearly not what the setting is, right? You, you don't take my setting and then just, like, tear it up in front of me. That's not how, that's not how we're going to do it. But if you want to use my setting and say a kingdom works slightly differently or, you know, st brilliant. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all, you know? GM is God and all that. Anyway, I don't want to go into detail about all the toxic moments in that campaign. When I do, I'll write the story as a summary of the whole campaign with each awesome moment and each shit moment. So, the thing about this campaign was that I was playing with a group that just couldn't get their act together to come and play. It was very difficult to round everybody up, so we only ever played every month or every two months. Because of this, each session was huge. I know you personally dislike hearing about massive RPG or wargaming sessions, and I agree with you that there is a threshold where it's, where it's just time to stop playing. Yes. However, I enjoyed these super long sessions because we would all spend the day together. We would take lots of breaks, go out and eat and come back, etc. And afterwards, some or all of us would usually continue drinking and carry on with lots of discussion about the game. Well, that sounds really cool. Anyway, each session had the same issue during the planning phase. Location, location, location. Near the end of the campaign, one of the players had moved in with her boyfriend and he had just joined the campaign. He offered to let us play at his place for the remainder of the campaign, as he lived with his parents and they lived in, McMa in McMansion. Okay? In a McMansion. So, a big old mansion. He was also a big 40k player with a huge collection of terrain, so I bought the minis and he had terrain and it worked out really well. So, we organise everything, I pick up some players and drive over and I start setting up for the day. He has us set up in the dining room. It's part of this big space at the back of the house that includes the kitchen, dining, and a small lounge and a small lounge room. They have a lounge room as what? Well. Ooh, posh tats. Uh, they. <laughs> I mean, everyone has a lounge. I mean, where you sit down, but like having a small lounge room as well as your large lounge room is a bit. Anyway, they had a massive table with like eight chairs, so it was perfect. I set up my computer and everything, so a friend could Skype into the game too. We didn't actually play for a very, for very long this time, but uh, as the setup took a while, we didn't start the game until maybe after lunchtime. We could have played well past 10pm, but decided to call it around 8 for one reason, his mother. So over the course of the game, our host's mother kept hovering around. I will recount all of this from my perspective, so you get a sense of how weird and uncomfortable things got. Later on, some things about his mum's behaviour were explained to me and it made more sense. As we were setting up, his, was his mum MILF? Probably not, but you know. Just, I, I, it just sounds like the start of a porno to me. Anyway, as we were setting up, his mum came home and put her groceries away and was talking to us, etc. 
Naturally, I was thankful that we got to use her space for the gaming, and so having conversation with her was the least I could do to ensure I was being respectful. Yeah, good lad. Well done. She was curious about what we were doing, and looking at our setup on the table. Her son showed his character sheet, explained how I invented the setting, and how it was played, and I got the sense that this was a conversation that had happened many times before. She obviously didn't understand what we were doing, which is fair enough. Now, as soon as the gaming starts, I get into the zone. I try very hard to put on accents to, to really roleplay the setting, etc. And it's my headcanon. I need to put a bit more work into it so the players are invited into this world, understand the cultures in it, and also have agency within it, within it as players. They very much didn't want to be playing a stupid murder hobo campaign, and wanted everything that, that, that they did to be true to the setting. Naturally, this means that none of us have the time for small talk. We're not sitting around having a drink, hanging out, we are role-playing, this is an activity. This sounds really cool. This sounds like a great campaign. His mum didn't get it. I kind of assumed that she would go about her business in a different part of the house, considering it was a large six-bedroom place, and the back area we were playing in was pretty closed off from the rest of the house. But she stayed in there the whole afternoon and evening. Throughout our game, she came in out of the backyard, constantly pestered her son about things. She watched TV very loudly, and he had to ask her to turn it down several times. Wow. At one point, she let the chickens in and, and interrupted a scene because he needed to have uh, a look at the infection of one of the chickens had in its eye. So the son needed to have a look at the... So the, her son tends the chickens. Wow. Like, what kind of a house is this? Bringing in fucking cows next. She made, a lot, she made lots of cups of tea. Good girl and always offered to make some more. So you can imagine that it was a bit awkward. No one wanted to just come out and tell her she needed to leave us alone. Uh, th that's that's the son's duty, to be honest with you. Like, if it's, if it's being that kind of a day, like, you need to just say, listen, Mum, uh, turn it off, or, like, you know, we'll go play somewhere else. It's no problem, you know. She put on, like, three loads of laundry, hung them all in the back area as it was a drizzly day. So, th so she's hanging laundry around you at this point. Several times she asked uh, my old mate to do something for her, and he would go and do it, pausing the game. All through the afternoon, while doing a million things in the back area, she kept giving uh, our game the side eye. If she didn't come, uh, if she didn't just come out and stand there awkwardly looking at us play, hovering like a shadow. Throughout this, his girlfriend was getting super pissed. I could just see it in her face. There was like a two-hour respite when his mum went for a nap. Then she came back and started to potter around incessantly. Yeah, man, I think I would have just been like... I'm the kind of person who gets annoyed at other people. Um, in sometimes like a like a like an overzealous way. You know, I'll get like, oh my God, just, just fuck off. Just, just fuck off. You know, I just... Um, it's like people chewing with their mouths open. It's kind of like that. And so if somebody was doing this and it was even in somebody else's house, I, would have to, I wouldn't say something to them, but I would say something to the son. Like, this mate, I find it really hard to concentrate. I really appreciate that we're here playing the game in your place, and I really uh, thank you very much, but I can't concentrate. I can't play like this. Either we, we do it right or, I, or we stop. That's it. You know what I mean? And doing it right is asking your mum to leave us the fuck alone while we're doing this, because, you know, it's stressful at the best of times. Anyway. So, she came and stood near us. Uh, sorry, uh, then she came back and started to potter around incessantly. She seemed to be looking for something, and she started cooking something. Then over, then over an hour, she was continuously farting and burping. It was very weird. Okay, yeah, this got really... This got really... Yeah, this isn't a MILF then. Fair enough, no porno. She came and stood near us watching the game. Our mate at one point explained something that was happening in the game and how the rules and dice rolling helped to dictate the outcome. She was nodding a bit, then she did a huge burp right onto the table and walked away. Then she had her dinner sitting on the couch in the den, watching TV as loud as possible. After she finished eating, she kept burping and sighing very loudly. I did ask the old mate if she was okay, to which, which he replied, yeah, she does, she does this around this time. Around 7.30 mark was the first time I realised that we had overstayed our welcome, as she, was as she very emphatically yelled out, How long exactly does this take? So we wrapped things up for the night. Yeah, man. Listen, um... If someone says, come round and play at my place, 
and they live at home with their parents. Nah. Nah. Go and, I'd rather you played in a bar than that. You know what I mean? There are tons of places out there where you can go and play without having to go around somebody's house. You know? Later outside, after I packed my car and they were saying goodbye to me, our mate explained a couple of things. Firstly, he was quite annoyed at his mum because he had spent some time apparently explaining what we would be playing in the dining room and what that would entail, and how she can't just interrupt constantly because we need the space. He has friends over all the time to play Warhammer, but they play in the garage in the garage. Okay. Now you might be wondering, why didn't you just play in the garage? Yep, yeah, I was literally wondering that. And I don't really remember, but I think it had something to do with how cold it was at the time. Okay. Additionally, he explained that his mum used to be an alcoholic and had essentially pickled her brain. I said that I figured it must have been something like that because it was pretty confusing that she had this huge house to be in with another den elsewhere and yet she was sticking around making it very clear that we were in the way the entire time. Of course, any annoyance or mirth I felt towards the situation was gone when he explained his mum's behaviour. However, he was still annoyed that he had to ask her to do something else and she still acted, she still acted that way. Apparently, she had been more like more since like this since the girlfriend had moved in, walking into the room at 5:30 a.m. reminding them he, that he needed to mow the lawn. Yeah, fuck this. I don't, nah, man. I don't care what's wrong with my mum. She's getting kicked down the stairs. If, she, if somebody comes in to my room at 5:30 a.m., nah, especially if you're paying rent. If you're not paying rent, fair enough, put up with that shit. But if you're paying rent and you're doing shit for her, and she comes into your room at 5:30 a.m. Kick downstairs is a bit much, you know what I mean? But like, that's how I would feel. I would get the get get the actual fuck out, man. What, mom? What would you do if I walked in and my arse was going up and down in the air? Because I'm in here with my girlfriend. She lives here too. What would you do? Right? Knock or don't come in. In fact, it's 5:30 a.m. Fuck off. Just fuck off. Go away. Right? You know. Oh Jesus Christ. Like when I'm looking after my grandpa and I stay with him right for a few days. Um. Like, he ne never bothers me, ever. Like, I'm always, if, if I'm in bed, whatever, if I have a late night because I'm working or recording or I'm doing something and I go to bed at, like, 3 or 4 in the morning, like, he, he, he never makes any noise in the morning because he knows, right? And he's he's, uh, he's he's getting on now, seeing our old man, but he knows. And if he can know that, I, I, I think a lot of this is personality. I really do. I think a lot of this is an excuse. It's personality. <clears throat> um... I've known drug addicts, I've known people with, with mental issues, I've known people who, who are alcoholics. Um, sometimes you're just a prick. You know what I mean? Just is what it is. Anyway, cheers for that, Kalish. Thank you very much, my friend. So, pointy eared Botwanga says, in other words, Elf says, Good evening, Mr. Ex Exile. I have been listening to your stories for a long time now and feel it's long past due that I contribute. Okay. I'm having a break writing my dissertation. I suppose I'm still trying, but it's a much more fun topic to type about. I wasn't sure if I wanted to start with a hobby nightmare or something more positive, but screw it. Why not one of each? There was a mini tournament type affair that happened at my local GW store for the release of Warhammer Fantasy 7th Edition. They opened at 7am because it was the 7th edition. Yeah, I don't care what kind of edition it is. I'm not opening the store at 7am. Um, go home, nerds. I'm being in bed. I'm normally up really early anyway, so it was fine to get in so early, but felt better for the staff that should that, should that logic continue, they'd be getting longer in bed for, such, for each subsequent edition at least. Yeah, well, yeah. 8th edition, 9th edition. Of course, GW stopped at 8th eight, eight edition because, you know, there you go. For the first few hours after opening, you would play 750 point games to try and get in the final knockout round, uh, where the winner would get the prize of a Forge World Giant. Every victory would get your name in the hat, so the more you won, the more likely you would get to the finals. I played Hordes of Chaos with Beasts of Chaos allies at the time, and generally Chaos units are very elite and so expensive. Having so, so small an army, I had a few of the elite Chaos warriors and quite a lot of the cheaper beasts. Uh, with a with a plain beast hero with minimal upgrades, you got combat points for having banners, ranks, and outnumbering your opponents. So I was hedging my bets on some static uh, combat resolution to help me out. 
As I'm setting up my army for the first game, some guy comes over. He points and laughs at the beastmen in my army, slightly re reminiscent of Nelson and the Simpsons, <laughs> and declares that they're rubbish in the new edition. I was taken aback and didn't really say anything before he sauntered off somewhere else in, in the store. I felt a bit deflated before starting, but I'd got my army out ready and it's not like I had other models with me, so I just carried on, played and tried to put that sour start behind me. I win a couple of games and drew another, but it was enough to get me into the finals. This round is much different though. So from your 750 points, you had to pick up to 75 points to put on a single unit. Now, this could be a mix of different units. I could have a mix of Chaos Warriors and Beast Men if I wanted to. Looking at either either a tiny handful of warriors in that limit or more beast men. I went all in on the beast men. The biggest unit I could field was with a banner. Each player would roll a d6 and those rolls will be added up. And that was the distance you set up you set up from each other. You would roll off again to see who went first. Okay. That sounds very interesting. Like almost like fantasy kill team. First round I come up against three Bretonian knights of the realm. I got to go first and charge straight away, being like six inches away. I didn't do any damage, uh, curse their two plus armor save, but they did very little back. I had a couple of ranks, a banner and an outnumber. So it was a, a break test. Roll 2d6 and get under your leadership minus how much you lost to the combat by. The Knights of the Realm legged it and the Beastmen cut them down, catching them with their pursuit roll. That's brilliant. Off to a solid start. The local power gamer was playing on the table next to me. We'll call him F for fuckwit. Well, fuckwit was the kind of knobhead who ran an Empire gun line list every game in 6th edition fantasy, but had a very short game in the finals. He took his wizard, failed to cast anything in his turn, got charged the turn after, ran away because he only had like a two wound model with no armor, failed to rally and proceeded to run off the board. It was lovely to see a bit of karma in action. I'll come back another time with some more tales about fuckwit. Okay. If I go quiet, I'm taking a drink of water. The next round, I saw off a bunch of dryads, which I normally took out before coming face to face with three ogre bulls in the final two. Yeah, three ogre bulls is a really good, is a really good strong choice for a game like this. They were hitting hard, but I had a lot of attacks to chip them down but my static combat resolution kept me in the fight. My numbers paid off, and the ogres lost. I won. I won the fight with only beastmen in the finals, and it came back to me. The guy who had made a sneering comment about them the first thing in the morning. I felt so elated. Not only did I win a forge well giant for my efforts, but I proved a snarky bugger wrong at the same time. I caught his eye in the group and I was being presented with my victory, and he looked, pr and he looked pretty awkward. Haha, <laughs> got to love the plucky underdog in the fight. Anyway, the nightmare for today was one for my friend and his cursed wood elves. It wasn't really his playstyle to be fair, and he never won a game. He didn't really he didn't play them that well and couldn't really get his head around them. He played he'd come from playing dwarves. So it was like night and day in terms of difference. Well, the wood elves had a magic item called the Hail of Doom Arrow, where once per game, instead of firing a single shot, with the character you, you would fire 3d6 shots that round. So between 3 and 18 shots, with an average roll of 10 or 11. Every game prior, he would only manage to get 6 or so. This game, he got 11. Slightly above average, but he felt like the curse was finally lifting. Even with the modifiers worked in, he, he was still hitting on a 2+. plus. He rolls the dice. 2 hits. 2 hits. 11 dice, and 9 of them are 1s. I have never, ever seen such a botched dice roll before in the fifty in my 15 years or since. Fortunately for my friend, neither has he. Funnily enough, that was his breaking point for him with the Wood Elves, and, and he moved on to another army that he enjoyed much more. Though that was a low bar. Thanks for reading my stories. Uh, I have quite a few more if you'd like to hear them. Keep up the good work. Yeah, send them in, man. Those are really fun and nicely written. Right. Locutus of Borg says hi northern i have a short one for you today uh, uh, about your channel and my friend's mind on alcohol okay a couple of months ago i wrote to you about a DD campaign in which the dm let one of one of the players have ownership papers 
of another player without her consent. Yes, yes, we've done that, yeah. The five of us from that campaign are still good friends. We just don't play D&D together anymore. So, a quick recap, because I remember this one. Um, quick recap for those of you who, who want to know. So, yeah, in, in Loctus, L L Locutus's, sorry, last story, he showed us a essentially a story where a female player was in the game and another player, a bit of a cringe player, bought her as a slave, essentially, without her knowledge. And the DM let him get away with it, and he started doing pretty creepy things with that uh, with that concept. To which they rebelled, and eventually, I think, I think she got the... Uh, I think they ended up tying him up, and they got the, 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 the contract back, and they burned it. So, so it, happy ending at the end of the day. A few days ago, I got a Discord message from the DM with a YouTube link. After the link, he said, what the fuck? Nice making shit up about me and lying about things that never happened. The message was sent at 3am, so I was in bed. By the time I saw the messages, they were deleted, so I couldn't see what the link was that he sent me, but my phone notification still showed what the message said. When I asked him about what the hell he was talking about, he said he made a mistake and don't worry about it. Upon pressing him more, he told me what happened. One of the other players also listens to your videos. Well, hello to you if you also listen to my videos. I hope you're not the person who's buying buying young women as slaves in a DD d game, because that's pretty creepy, dude. Don't do that again. And knew my story was about our campaign. He told the DM uh, that we made it on YouTube. Hooray. And sent, th and sent him the link with the timestamp. But he sent the wrong link. <laughs> Brilliant. That's hilarious. Or at least that's what I think that happened. Both of them were very drunk at 3am, so their memories of the details are pretty murky. Either way, it sounds like he found a D&D &D story in which the DM was trying to hit on a female player, or get in her pants or something like that. Given that the only woman in, in our group was my wife, that would, be pretty, that would be pretty bad. So, in his drunken stupor, he assumed I was making shit up about him, and sent those pissy messages. Sometime later, they realised after that they watched the wrong, the wrong video. After he listened to the actual story that I'd sent, his response was simply, yeah, fair enough, I didn't handle that very well. Well, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. We all live in a different area of the US, and this happened the day before our annual in-person meetup. When we met at the airport, I gave him some shit for it. We had a good laugh and had a great weekend. So, all was well. Brilliant. I'm really happy about that. Um, <laughs> that is quite funny that you sent in the wrong video. Or, like, you, you got the wrong video sent to him. Um, I would be pretty pissed as well if I read that story and, and it, people were saying it was it was me, you know. Uh, but yeah, cool. I'm glad you all got it sorted out. And yeah, thank you for watching my videos, guys. And I hope you enjoy the the channel and uh, some of the cringy cringy ho yeah, cringy hobby horror stories that we have going on. I shouldn't have named it hobby horror stories because my uh, oh cringy nightmares. Uh, do you know what? Never mind. My brain is frazzled. It's Monday. Monocle says. Uh, Mr. Exile, Lord of the North. Hello. Uh, archivist of horror of horror stories and, and to my fellow followers, friends, hobbyists, and everyone in between. Right, this guy's on a soapbox. I like it. Firstly, just wanted to say thanks, North, for your content and the work and gusto you put into it has got me through some tough weeks. So cheers, man. No problem, dude. Um, I will say I'm learning more as a YouTuber, like not to, and a pretty small one at that not to um, to cherish the positive feedback and the con constructive feedback I take on board but the bitchy and moaning the bitchiness and moaning I've started to just ignore that now you know I've even blocked a few people from watching my videos or from commenting on my videos because they're just it's just bile they just, they just come on and just shout shit so without actually doing anything constructive I'm the kind of person you can say anything to me as long as, it's, as long as it's constructive. You can even tell me to fuck off in a really nice way, and I'll still, you know, be fair, you know, fair with you and talk to you about it. Um, if I think you're being a dick, I'll tell you. But you know, it's what it is. But yeah, don't don't come on and just be a twat because I'm small enough. I, I'll see it. I'm not this huge YouTuber where you'll get away with that shit. I'll see it and you won't be able to comment again because you know I don't put up with it. I don't make enough money from YouTube to put up with shit <laughs> so it just is what it is and the minute i don't enjoy this i won't do it anymore so you know so monocle says firstly just want to say thanks okay we've done that bit thank you very much anyways i digress here's my tale of horror woe and bewilderment now let's go back in time two months a friend of mine let's call him phil 
He's a nice guy and invites me to a beer hammer session. Now, I'm not saying I'm a social butterfly, but I'm usually happy to meet new people. But, because of this wonderful hobby attracting some weirdos, yes, yes, I know, we're all a bit weird, ranging from that guy to creeps, I'm always filled with a sense of trepidation when, when I do beer hammer sessions. For those of you who don't know, beer hammer is literally playing Warhammer and getting drunk whilst you're doing it. But I agree, and me and Phil head off to this gathering of beer hammer. Hooray! First session, I don't take any models. I go and get a feel for the group dynamic. So, there's four plus me. Phil, my mate. Richard, an absolute melt of a man. <laughs> I love that saying. <laughs> melt. It's just, it just such a such a lovely... It's just such a British... A British saying for a dickhead. What a melt. <laughs> Richard, an absolute melt of a man. Steve, the host, lovely guy. And Erin, the rare kind of hobbyist. Stunning. You know what I mean. Oh, God, okay. Alright, cool. Anyways, and when Erin walks into a room, does, any, does everybody's bellies get sucked in? That normally happens. All the hobbyists go, oh, oh gotta, uh, gotta adopt a pose. Uh. Anyway, the four of us are fighting it out over, the cent over a central relic. Okay. Oh, the four of them are fighting out over a central relic. Lots of wonderful terrain. The roster is as follows. Phil, Black Templars. Steve, Orcs. Erin, Dark Angels. And Richard, Tau. Yeah, I've gone right off, Erin. But anyway. Uh, groans and, and, and eye rolls. Robert Downey, Jewel, Robert Downey Jr. meme here. Yeah, Tau's alright. So there's me just chatting absolute twaddle. Being the gang by... T uh, between the gang by turn four. Everyone plays till there's pretty much nothing left. I noticed that that uh, Dick has left Eren's Dark Angels pretty much alone the entire game. More on that later. So this is um, the Melt. Which one's the Melt? Uh, Richard Dick for short. Right, he's Melt of a man. His name's Dick for short. Okay, cool. So the Melt, Richard, has left Eren's Dark Angels pretty much alone for the entire game. More on this later. As the night progresses... I realised that Dick was pretty blunt and a bit cold towards me. I'm not a neckbeard, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say I'm bad looking, a bloke, really. Probably a strong six, maybe pushing a seven on a good day. More on this later. Yeah, you know what, I'd I, I put myself in the same category. Five or six, and if, I, if I'm dressing up and I look really good, you know, in what I'm wearing, probably a seven. Uh, but, you know, in, in the right, I've always said in the right groups, I'm a seven, you know. So I shake it off, uh, and the night ends. Fast. And it, do you know what? Before anyone says that's unhealthy, no, it's not. Like, admitting that you're not like the best-looking person in a room is not like unhealthy. Just you got yourself aware. It's fine. Own that shit. No problem. You know, if Stav, if Stav from Come Town can pull women, can any of us can pull women? Anyway. So I shake it off, and the night ends. Fast forwarding a couple of weeks, Phil can't make it. So I attend. My list isn't meta, more narrative, a small 1,000 point nid force, a winged hive tyrant, a turvagon, termagaunts, and a carnifex. I arrive, just main Steve at first. I unbox my list and he's impressed. I've gone for a fluffy narrative list. His orcs are just chocker with melee and the killer can dread dreadnought thing. I shiver knowing in melee I'm getting mulched. Erin arrives with her dark angels and we have a chin wag uh, whilst we unbox and wait for Dick. Dick arrives, unkempt, his lunch in his beard. <laughs> his lunch in his beard, generally just a mess. He unboxes his list, railguns, 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 railguns everywhere. I look at my big bugs already coming to terms with losing them. <laughs> the game starts, relic again. We roll for first turn and I'm up first. Now, I'm massive on thematic play, good lad. My plan was to just launch my winged tire tyrant at the relic and have my entire swarm follow behind. Erin and Steve clash on the outskirts and Dick just vaporises my winged boy in his shooting phases. No, sport no sportsmanship to allow to follow why did you do that? What a retarded thing to do as he points out where my winged boy once stood. Wow, what a nice guy. I reply, big lad wanted the relic. I smile and giggle and get a giggle out of Erin. I catch Dick's expression at Erin. 
Oh shit. Next turn. With my winged boy down, my bugs are having a free-for-all. Charging out in all directions, looking for the closest biomass. Thematic, remember? I've now gone to being a nuisance on the field. It's an absolute bloodbath. I get cut down left and right and centre. This is where me and Erin are absolutely in stitches at, at my termagant charging her terminators. Cute dick, rending his, rending his clothes. This isn't right, he says. That's not proper play. I blink at the bloke. You killed my tyrant. They don't have any guidance from the hive mind anymore. Come on, man, it's just a game. I feel Erin looking at me and she's smiling. I'd already caught a couple of glances throughout the game but paid no heed to it. My headspace isn't in the right place for anything like that. This just enrages Dick though. Steve's tri tri uh, trying to chill in the room. Dick then picks up my winged boy from the dead pile, lifting it up high, screeching about how it should have been used. Okay. Cue Dick rage dropping it when everyone told him to chill. So yeah, broken hive tyrant. After that, Dick starts packing up. Erin help, Aaron helps me collect broken wing boy pe uh, pieces and Dick just stands there glaring at the both of us. And Steve at the door, waiting for Dick to leave. After that, we reset the game minus my tyrant and had a blast. Just a quick one from me. Hopefully you enjoyed it and my little tidbit of hobby horror. So, um, this sounds to me like you're a normie. A normal looking guy going into a hobby situation um happens a lot you know and again I, remember what i said before like in a normal club or whatever i think i reckon guys like this are like a five or a six and if they dress up and they look nice they have their hair cut whatever they're a, they're a seven right in a normal club environment that means if you've got the gift of the gab you can probably pull right you can probably pull somebody in a nerdy environment filled with mostly neckbeards Add one to each of those scores, you know. So this guy in a normal neckbeardy environment, he all of a sudden he's a six or a seven, and if he dresses up and looks good and smells good, he's an eight or maybe even a nine in that situation, right? And that's what's happened here, I think, is that he's he's a he's a normal looking guy, you know, not the best looking guy from a, a normal perspective, but like he's gone into a geeky situation, he knows geekdom. He's got the gift of the gab, it seems like here. So he's having a laugh and a joke and he can take a loss, right? And he's just, he's he's, accent he's accentuating everybody else's fun. That's the main thing on a night out that you need to do if you want to be able to, like, attract people is you need to be able to make sure that you're accentuating everybody else's fun. That, uh, that the fun is revolving around you. I'm not saying be, um, you know, center of attention all the time. What I mean is that, you know, you're, you're aiding in the fun for everybody else. You know, you know what I mean? And Because people can tell that from miles away. They can just tell that you're just, you know, really good at being fun. So, yeah, that's what this guy did. And it looks like he was getting some joy out of this errand person. Um, I'd be very interested to know if you actually dated that person or whether it was just a one-time thing. But anyway, Natna says... Oh, by the way, um, th that is the first story in, in about a month that we've had a happy ending, sort of. You know, uh, and I bet there's lots of people in the comments saying, "Oh my god!" and everybody clapped. Uh, shut up, you fucking neckbeard! Shut your mouth. Just because you don't get any any anything from any women doesn't mean that you can start tearing anyone else down. All right, just shut up. Just enjoy the stories. Stop being a prick. Anyway, and I know a few of you were about to type there before I said that. Caught you. Don't be naughty. Anyway, Natna says, and this is the the sequel. Hi North. Figured I'd finish the tale of Tom before let, letting it linger too long. Yeah, man, you, you, you've been edging us for quite a while. For a quick recap, Tom was a 40-ish out-of-work hobbyist who worked, who used to come to my hobby store. Super nice and talented wargamer and painter who loved to help people out. One day, a random customer insinuated that he was a groomer. Alright, grooming kids. Continuing on. Time wore on, and everything kind of settled back down. I was still unnerved by the accusation, and that I didn't know the truth, but nothing much was coming of it. Then things started to heat, heat up again. A kid who came to the store, about 13 years old, became friendly with Tom. We'll call this kid Billy, and he really wanted to get better at painting. So, Tom kindly took him under his wing, uh, and taught him some skills. Nothing super unusual. 
I'd seen Tom do that to, to any hobbyist, he probably politely asked. Billy's mum was some kind of high-powered lawyer, or the like. Extremely well off, but always busy, and didn't really have a lot of time for her son. She was an odd duck herself, feeling very much a hippie, who somehow joined the world of suits. More than once, she'd flirt with me, and let it be known she wasn't wearing a bra. <laughs> Uh, if you think this doesn't happen to Games Workshop staff, you've never worked in Games Workshop. <laughs> the amount of MILFs. Because, do you know what you are though? Again, you're a guy surrounded by neckbeards. Again, is that, is that you, you add a point to your attractiveness cause, by the guys you're surrounded by. And then you've got, you know, a mum comes in, you're really good with all of the, all of the lads and they're all the kids who are coming in, you know. You're like a surrogate dad at the end of the day, and if you're doing your job properly, and uh, they're going to be all over that shit. Especially if they're single mums, they're going to be all over that shit, man. Like, you know. Steady job. Decent looking. Good with my son. Oof. You know, that, that's the end of that. Anyway. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, that tickled me. Uh, might have been fun if she wasn't like 30 years older than me. <laughs> Anyway, as Billy and Tom spent more time painting together, someone came up with a super fun plan. Why not help Tom out and give him part a part-time job watching Billy? This way, Tom would have a job again and Billy would have someone to take care of him. I wasn't keen on the idea given the rumour I'd heard and that no one really knew anything about Tom's private life. For as kind and helpful as he was, he didn't overly share about himself. This manny arrangement, as in a male nanny, initially went over very well. Billy and his mum were ecstatic that they had a babysitter that they liked. For months, Tom would take care of Billy, even going on a holiday with the family at one point. As weird as it was, and sometimes unsettling to me, the arrangement, co the arrangement continued until everybody was asked to, to... Sorry, sorry, until everybody was kind of used to the sight of it. Of course, then something happened. It started as rumours. Other kids coming in and whispering that something had happened between Tom and Billy. Something bad. This was followed up by neckbeards insisting that it ha was nothing and for people to mind their own business. I tried to worm out more details, but was having trouble. Before I knew it, real battle lines were drawn up in my store. People who supported Billy and people who supported Tom. Through all this, I had no idea what was happening and frankly, I had not been trained to deal with any of this shit. No, you're not as a GW employee. Growing more and more irritated, I one day managed to sit at a sullen and uncomfortable Billy down and asked him what happened one to one. I wanted answers. I needed to know why my store was being torn apart. He wouldn't share much, but he did share one incident. Basically, it went like this. One night, Tom was watching him and Billy woke up. Billy woke up to Tom climbing into bed with him. Clearly, clearly confused and uncomfortable, Billy demanded to know what was going, what he was doing and for him to get out. From there, Tom went on a tirade about how ungrateful he was and cruel to someone who had taken care of him. How he was a selfish kid, etc, etc. I was nowhere near as smart as I am now, but even then the description reeked of predatory behaviour. Yeah, th that, that's, 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 that's sick. That's some sick shit right there. That is a manipulation of the highest order. Disturbed by the story and the fact that there might be more than he was un that, that he was unwilling to share, I tried to think of what to do. Remember, I was hired to tell to sell toy soldiers and hobby supplies, not deal with all this. I alerted Billy's mother, but she seemed to be already aware of something was afoot. And I told Tom he should probably not come around until after the truth came out. I wanted to believe Tom was innocent but just couldn't take that chance. Of course, my asking Tom to leave was met by anger by, by, by the older hobbyists who gave me shit for believing the lies of some punk kid. Yeah, if I remember correctly, there was another hobby group in this story where it's mostly older neckbeards and uh, they were they were, they had a bit of a reputation for soliciting younger younger boys. And But when GW did an official investigation, they found nothing amiss. Right, so, you know, but then... And Tom was a part of this group. 
if I remember correctly. I wish this story had a happy ending, or at least a neat one. The truth is, I was still dealing with the fallout of this when my time with Games Workshop ended, or on less than great terms. As for the truth, I'm not sure I'll ever know. Years later, I did run into Tom at an independent game store, and we had a very brief and awkward exchange. So yeah, protect your kids, guys. One final story for now. Hopefully a shorter one. When I was hired at GW as a red shirt, I was the regional flo floater. So I'd go from store... <laughs> okay, floater in the UK means something different, dude, so may maybe... Anyway, I was the regional floater. <laughs> so I'd go from store to store, helping out where needed. One such store had another red shirt named Wayne. I am going to use his real name because he is a piece of shit. Sorry, but he is. Thanks for the warning, dude, before I read that. Wayne was a little odd, but alright. He was one of those steampunk type dudes, but could paint really well and never complained when, he, when, we made, when we made him paint the new releases. Frankly, I just found him annoying, as did his manager. Wayne was, all, was always thought he was really handsome and suave, but was kind of just a goofball. He would, he would, he could always pull, but he would, he could always pull certain girls. These idiots somehow swayed by his steampunk idiot charms. On one particular night, I had been sent to another store and was living my best life when the manager called me. Apparently, he had let, he had left Wayne to lock up the store and left. At some point, the manager realised he'd forgotten something and went back inside, only to find Wayne having sex on one of the gaming tables. Pretty gross already, but only made worse when he learned the girl was underage. Oh my god. Wayne was immediately fired, and I think there were some legal proceedings, but no, I never got round to what those were. From then on, we didn't want hobbyists to know we were talking about Wayne, so we'd simply refer to him as statutory. Oh my god. The follow-up to this story is years later. I was working for a TV studio, and on one of the shows I was processing was about street magicians. One of whom always wore a clock-like top hat, and conveniently liked to do his magic among props of teen, among groups of teen girls. It took me a few episodes before I started laughing as I realised it was Wayne. Thanks for letting me share. Love the videos, you're a legend. Thanks, man. That's hilarious. Sitting there with his fucking clock hat on. Oh my god. That's hilarious. I mean, like, you know, not hilarious that he's doing that shit. Um, the weirdest story I had from Games Workshop in terms of that um, was um, my trainer from a while, well, my, my first trainer at GW telling me about this story where he was running the, I think it was the bath store. And um, so it, it was one of the guy's birthdays and he was 18. And it was like, yeah, so he's a manager and he had, he had two guys working under, under him. And Anyway, this woman comes in looking for him, this 18-year-old staff member, and says, look, it's quite, it's quite, I'm like a relative, it's quite important that I speak to him, can I just have a moment of his time? And the manager said, yeah, sure, you know, like, like yeah, go in the back room, no problem, you know? And so this woman, who's like, you know, nicely dressed, good-looking girl, takes him in the back room. And after a while, the manager's like, well, where is he? He's been in there for like an hour, nearly. Jesus Christ, I'll go and check on them, make sure they're okay. He goes in, and sees this 18 year old getting a strip dance uh, and it looks like it was like the third or fourth strip dance he'd been given because she'd been paid for like an hour of time so he's like what the fuck are you doing like stop he goes all right yeah, fair enough yeah, yeah, yeah no, no problem no problem i'll be out in a minute and he's like never mind i'll be out in a minute fucking get her out of here you've got a stripper at games workshop get her out um but to me, I, I love that response. Like, he just, like, got a semi on. And he's like, yeah, in a minute. Yeah, I'll be out in a minute. It's like, how, how he was not sacked, I'll never know. But anyway, uh, those are my uh, Hobby Like Mares for today. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider going onto Patreon and giving whatever little you can. Uh, becoming a member of the channel. If you do become a member of the channel or a Patreon, you'll be entered into that prize draw, which I think will be uh, later on this month. And it'll be for £50 of free models no matter what game system they're from from composite games and you will have two chances to win 50 pounds it'll be a 100 pound prize spread over two people so get involved in a prize draw and if you want to support me even further 
whenever you're getting any sort of models or stuff, think about composite games. They give you 20% off at checkout and an extra 5% if you use the promo code Northern Exile down below, which means 25% off half the GW staff discount. Love you guys long time. I'll see you on Wednesday for more Hobby Nightmares. See you then. Keep sending them in. Love you guys long time. See you later. Bye.